In this review, I'll be looking at a new DAC from an indigenous Chinese company called Sonkos. It's called the LAQXD1, and it retails for somewhere around £152. It presents itself in a pretty dinky little chassis, but I think we need to take a closer look. And the sooner we get into that, the better, because it's a relatively extended closer look in this particular video. And welcome to the closer look section of this review. And you're looking at a box. The box contains the LA QXD1 DAC from Sonkos, or because that takes half an hour to say, we'll call it the D1 in this review, shall we? Now, I wanted to show you the box because it's very nice and it's very presentable. Look at that sort of silver foil there on the front. And it's that sort of typical, I don't know, that sort of Apple-esque quality, which is very nice indeed. And inside is, well, this, the actual DAC itself, offering quite a compact chassis with a minimal interface design. And as you can see, it's got the Sonkos logo on the top there and all of the inputs and outputs on the rear. Now, this chassis reminded me of something and I wasn't quite sure what that was until I stumbled across this in my reference section. Now, the bottom chassis is from our friends at RCAM. This is an old RDAC and it's very, very similar to the D1. It's smaller, yes. The interface is rather different, yes. The inputs and outputs on the back are rather different, true. However, the form factor is very similar. You have that CNC made out of a solid piece of aluminium thing going on, this sort of satin finish. Even the rounded corners on the chassis itself looks very familiar. Now, maybe I'm going a bit bonkers, but for me, I see a distinct family resemblance. Now, I'm not suggesting that RCAM has anything to do with Sonkos, not at all, quite the opposite. I'm wondering, and this is pure guesswork, if the Sonkos DAC was made in the same factory as RCAM's RDAC. Pure guesswork, just purely on circumstantial visual evidence, nothing more. Now, as I say, the D1 is made from a CNC machined solid block of aluminium. And in terms of your basic stats, you're looking at a 32-bit 768 kilohertz DAC here through PCM and up to DSD512. The coax and optical are slightly less impressive in terms of specs. They range up to 24-bit 192 kilohertz, but that's more than enough for most people. Let's flip around the back and just go to a little bit more detail. And what you can see is a coax input and output. You can also see a USB-C power socket. A cable is included, but not a plug. This sort of thing is becoming a bit of a fad where you have budget hi-fi, including a USB power cable, no plug, and well, the company expect you to use your phone's USB plug, don't they? But hey, what if it's actually, and I know this sounds revolutionary, what if it's actually powering your phone and you don't want to use that? You're gonna have to go and buy another one. So you're gonna have to budget for that as well. It's inconvenient because, well, even though USB plugs are not overly expensive, it's just the hassle of going out, trying to find one to buy, bringing it in, waiting for the post to arrive, blah, blah, blah. When you buy a piece of hi-fi, I don't know about you, but I certainly like to open the box and I just want to get on with it. I don't want to then have to think, I've bought product X, what extra things do I need to buy to get this actually up and running? I don't want to have to think like that. Now, Sun Cars is not the only one to do this, and I'm talking generally now, but it's not a trend I particularly like. Incidentally, if you're gonna power this machine, use this power socket. Don't power the DAC using USB on your computer, for example, because your computer doesn't produce enough power to get this thing up and running. The D1 needs a mite more oomph, and that's not supplied by your computer. So always plug it in, in the mains. Now you can see single-ended outputs, which is not unusual. What is slightly more unusual are the balanced outputs, which is very nice to see on a product 
of this low price. Spinning around to the front of the D1 and you're faced with a minimal interface of four tiny press in buttons. These power up the box and also change the volume and the source. And when you do change the source, corresponding lights on the top here will light up. The problem with these buttons is their size and the information they convey, which I'll get to in a second. Now, because of the button size and because volume is changed by pressing and holding the buttons, and also because there's no remote to utilize as an alternative, I wouldn't like to use this box as a preamp. The D1 just doesn't really encourage it. It's almost as if the preamp option has been provided in a rather grudging manner. Now, the D1 uses an ESS ES9038 Q2M DAC chip. And like many other modern DACs, this chip features a range of built-in filters. These filters are user extras, sort of EQ sound options, I would say. Again, like many other DAC chips out there, not all, but many, there's no way to turn off these filters. Now, I've reviewed DACs in which additional filtering like this could be disabled, and other DACs that have no additional filtering at all. And actually, I prefer that. I prefer DACs with no extra filtering, and I prefer DACs where you can turn off the bonus extra filtering. I tend to find that they sound, I don't know, smoother, purer? But these filters are always on, and I would recommend that you quickly shuffle through them and see which one you prefer. Or not, of course, you might just want to power this box up and just get on with it. Me, well, I'm one of those people that has to know to find the best possible variant. The issue is how these filters are selected by and presented to the user by the D1. The manual offers little help here, while the chassis interface is, well, I would call it substandard, basically. Why substandard? Well, let's compare it to another DAC in its price point, the Topping E30. And as you can see, I've placed the E30 on top of the D1. Now, Topping's E30 DAC offers the same fate accompli, but it allows you to cycle through the filters and very easily as well. So let's turn on the E30 and I've done this via the remote control. And let me show you that remote control because it's a factor in changing the filters themselves. And here is the remote control for the Topping E30. Now, what I like about this remote control in terms of selecting your desired filter is this button. This button basically is a filter select button. Keep an eye on the E30's readout and you'll see what I mean. Now, I'm gonna change the filter, here I go, pressing the filter button now, and you can see F3 has turned up. Now that's filter number three, press it again, filter four, filter five, filter six. Now the topping E30 manual itself tells you what each of these numbers refers to, which filter you're actually selecting. But the fact that you can select your filter and you have a visual confirmation, and you can select your filter via an easily accessible remote control button is great. That's what you want. You can't do that with the Suncos D1. It's a bit of a faff. So let's power on the Suncos and I'll show you exactly what I mean. Now I've turned on the Suncos and as you can see the power light is on and the source I've selected here is optical. If I press this little wheel here then that will change the source and let me just do that. I'll cycle through this coax and USB and back to optical. With power, if I press the power button once, that will mute the sound. And that's what you're seeing now with that flashing light, the sound has been muted. Press again and the sound is back. So on the D1, you press the power button for a few seconds whereupon the three lights on the chassis here display a range of light patterns, and it's your job to decode these patterns to find out exactly what filter you've selected. So let me do that now, and I will show you exactly what I mean. So, keeping that pressed down. Now, I am now cycling through all of the filters, and as you can see, the light patterns are changing. With every pattern change, a new filter is selected. Now, you tell me, 
What filters am I selecting? What filters am I actually scrolling through? You don't know, do you? And neither do I. And I'm the one who's just reviewed this. I've forgotten. I've got no idea. And Sankos doesn't really help either. Because if you look at the manual, the manual itself does a great job of displaying, what, seven sets of graphically based test data, data which should have stayed in the lab and has no place within a consumer manual. No, you need to access the company's website and the rather unfriendly graphic which offers the solution. And I'm going to pop that on the screen now for you to look at. Now, looking at this graphic, you need a few moments of study to get to grips with it. It's not exactly intuitive. As you can see here, each filter triggers a light indicated by the number one. Each filter then presents a unique light pattern. The effect looks like a primitive computer. And I forgot to tell you what the filters are actually called, because of course you can't really tell by this graphic. All you're given are abbreviations. Now, again, don't ask Songkaz because they won't tell you. That includes any information you might find on their website, anything you might find in their product FAQ, and even the manual. None of that tells you what these filters are actually called. All you'd get, as I say from the company, is a series of mysterious abbreviations, things like FAM and FAL. Well, what I'll do, I will place the abbreviations and what each one stands for in the description below this review. So at least you'll have a reference there. Now the lights you can see in front of you are nicely illuminated, but in real life, when you're actually using this in a listening room, these lights are rather too bright. Oh, and as for the so-called manual, including information that was in any way useful was sprawled over, what, three very small pages? Look, we're not talking about a 300 page manual here where a download is actually valid. This information could have been squeezed onto a small card and popped into the box. There's absolutely zero reason why this information should be download only. If somebody like iFi can include this sort of information on a small fold out card in its newly released DAC products and can charge a similar price or even less, then why can't Suncos do the same? There are design issues here, but how does the thing sound? I brought in some test equipment to help along with the sound test. So let me quickly show you that because I never normally do that, do I? So let me riffle through some of the gear I'm going to be using for this test. Now, one of the pieces of software, if I can put it in those terms, is this CD from Bing Crosby and also Bob Scobie. Bing has a mellifluous baritone voice full of texture and Bob Scobie brings his Frisco jazz band, plus some complex percussion. You've got some organic brass section and all of those contrasting textures that you would normally find from a jazz band. Lots of accuracy is required here, lots of delicacy and finesse to convey the music properly. Next, I chose a rather more high energy rock selection. In this case, a album from the Police box set, and that's every move you make, the studio recordings. Inside is the album Zenyatta Mondata, and I'll be picking on one or two tracks in there, which produce some good bass response, and again, some intriguing complex percussion and quite complex lead guitar as well. In terms of hardware, you've seen the topping E30 already, and here's the rear of the same. I'll also be looking at the Astle and Kern AK120, which is a rather useful workhorse in terms of external digital audio players. This is the iFi Zen DAC, which I haven't reviewed on this channel. And if you'd like a review of the iFi Zen DAC, I've done the Zen Blue, which is the Bluetooth thing, but uh, not this one, which is the Zen DAC. So if you want a review, give me a shout and um, I'll sort it. However, I'm going to be using this as a reference for the USB DAC section of the Suncos D1. So that'll be that one. Here's the, uh, here's the rear, incidentally, of the iFi. And pulling back a bit to try and get the whole thing in shot is the Audiolab 6000 CDT CD transport. I'll be using a good quality Telerium Q digital cable and connecting that to the D1 just to see how the D1 reacts in that configuration. And I'll be connecting that via the coax port. Everything will get 
a run out. That includes the balance ports, I'll be able to test those as well. And we'll talk about the sound quality from the balanced outs compared to the single ended. And that's it from this rather long close up section. But how does the Sonkos D1 actually sound? Well, let's do some sound tests and we'll find out, shall we? And we're back with the sound tests. Now, I mentioned the filters in the closer look section, and we need to sort that out before we can progress with the rest of this review. I need a level playing field before I do the rest of the sound tests, and I really need to know which filter I'm going to be using while I'm doing the rest of these tests. So I need to riffle through quickly the filters. And I did just that. So let me quickly go through them for you now and we'll settle on the filter of choice and then we can carry on. To select the filter, I hooked up my Audiolab 6000 CDT transport, connected that to the D1 via a Telerium Q digital coax. And I used the polices. Zenyata Mondata and the track Shadows in the Rain. I chose a random filter just to get things underway. In this case, the minimum phase slow roll off. I chose to compare that to an extreme filter and this one was the brick wall filter, which sounded typically clinical and bright in the mids with a sharp edged thwack from the bass and an overall icy response from the soundstage. So I retreated quickly from that and instead tried a minimum phase fast roll off, which offered a more open soundstage, not the same nastily aggressive mids, but still a rather clinical output from the upper frequencies, especially during vocal crescendos. Hybrid fast roll off was better, still edgy in terms of mid range with tizzy treble from cymbals, sounding not quite as clinical in overall presentation. Flipping over to a linear phase fast roll off. This extended the space in the mid range, but I could still sense listening fatigue approaching from the distance because of those compressed mid range frequencies. Appadizing fast roll off, which is the default when you switch on this DAC, civilized the lower frequencies a tad, adding measure of space in the soundstage and minimizing the aggressive tendencies of many of the fast filters listed here but the minimum phase slow roll off still sounded the best to my ears. Final comparison was something called linear phase slow roll off, but the bass didn't sound quite as organic as it did on the minimum phase slow roll off. While the mids offered a measure of civilizing behavior with little or no aggression on view. Hence the minimum phase slow roll off was my filter of choice. And that's the filter I used for the rest of this review. I then turned to another police track from the same album called The Other Way of Stopping. This is a high energy instrumental with a combination of percussive patterns, the potential for pinched lead guitar mids, notable bass and contrasting cymbal work. The first comparison I wanted to make was with Topping's E30. So that's what I did. I brought that in and I connected the E30 to my audio lab transport and compared the two to see how each one sounded. I found the E30 in comparison to the D1 sounded a little thin and harsh in its presentation. The E30 had a slightly simplistic, rather primitive sound with the lead guitar sounding a little thin and percussion moving away from the neutral and organic. Now I must emphasize the E30 on its own sounded excellent, but when it came head to head with the D1, the E30 walked away with a bloody nose. The D1 in fact had a relatively organic, elegant sound presentation, offering balance and finesse in the mids with a reverb laden suite of complex lower frequencies. While the E30's bass veered towards the plastic, the D1 provided a more naturalistic response. This output was best heard from a jazz outing being with a beat via Bing Crosby and Bob Scobie's Frisco Jazz Band and the track Let a Smile Be Your Umbrella from the Bluebird label. The parping of the brass section, vocal crescendos and the crisp early percussive strikes 
we're all prime for edge and the proverbial lit mid-range. But instead, the D1 soundstage offered a relatively neutral and balanced play, with a honed and detailed percussive backing to a generally smooth brass output and textured emotive vocal performance. That the treble never tizzed, or mids never barked, the bass never bloomed, was a testament to the performance of this little DAC. The contrast between the trumpet and trombone on one side of the soundstage and the sax on the other was a testament to the tonal transparency from the D1. Next up, I wanted to test the D1's balanced outs. Now, just because a unit has a pair of balanced outs, that doesn't mean the balanced outs are gonna sound better than your single endeds. It doesn't always work out like that. And the reason it doesn't always work out like that is because balanced outputs tend to work well when they are implemented properly. It depends how you implement them. There is a difference between sticking a pair of balanced outs in the chassis and making them sound good. The difference, that gap in the middle, that's where the art lies. It doesn't always work out. In a lot of occasions it does, sometimes it doesn't. So let me give you an example. A few years ago, I did an amplifier group test for the UK national magazine, Hi-Fi World. This is going back a bit. And one of the amplifiers was one of those retro, 70s retro looking Yamaha amplifiers, integrated. And it wasn't going well. Uh, there were eight or nine other amplifiers. Most of them sounded better than the Yamaha. This was in single-ended mode now. And the Yamaha was a bit bright, edgy, not particularly pleasant to listen to. I was about to give up on the thing and noticed it had balanced outs. Plugged in the balanced outs, it transformed the entire thing. It was an amazing amplifier through the balanced outs. In the single-ended mode, it was a disaster. In balanced mode, it was wonderful. That cost about, oh, I don't know, I'm guessing three, four hundred pounds worth of amplifier-ish, somewhere around that. On the other side of the coin, fairly recently, I reviewed an amplifier called an X250. I'll put a link down below. About eight and a half thousand pounds worth, I think, I'm thinking off the top of my head, somewhere around that, eight and a half grand, from a Dutch company whose name I can't remember, because I'm just thinking about this now off the top of my head and I haven't done any research or reading up. I'll put links in. By the time this video comes out, you'll see the links. Anyway, a lot of money. And wonderful in terms of single-ended mode, beautifully smooth mids, very cultured. Then I hooked it up in balanced mode because it had balanced outs. Totally different machine, almost like a different amplifier. It sounded okay, but there were issues. It wasn't good. You can find more in the review I link below. The amplifier itself is a great amplifier and I gave it an award-winning rating, as you, again, as you'll see below. But if I had the choice, I wouldn't use balanced outs. So you can see it's not really price dependent. It doesn't really matter how much the thing costs. It depends how you implement balanced mode, how important you see balanced mode in your amplifier design. And not everybody gets it, not everybody implements it properly. So, has the D1 implemented this properly or not? Here I was happy to hear an enlarging of the soundstage and space infused within, which enhanced the naturalistic tonality from the sound. It's also increased the amount of detail on view. On the other hand, the mid-range was brighter and rather clinical in execution. So again, I wondered about the execution of the balanced option here. Balanced provided a one step forward, two step back approach. That extra space produced a lovely maturity in the mids, but those mids did indeed sound like peak limiting had been pushed to the red and the clinical edge provided issues which drove me back to single-ended mode. And that, my friends, is where I stayed for the rest of this review. I then connected the D1 to my Astell & Kern digital audio player and did this via optical and played Bob Marley's jamming at 24-bit 96K. First up, 
Make sure you push that optical cable fully home before you play. I was left wondering why I couldn't hear a note until I pushed the cable once more for that final click. Once up and running, the Hi-Res file sounded smooth, despite its own inherent rather compressed nature. Bass was full and rounded with a powerful low frequency drive, while the Bob Marley vocal was both open and expressive. Yes, the treble was a tad tizzy and fizzy, but that was the nature of the master of the music itself, not the DAC. On the whole, the music flowed easily with enough instrumental separation to provide plenty of detail across the soundstage. I ended by pushing a DSD128 file from Eric Bibb and his song Meet Me at the Building via a laptop, in my particular case a MacBook. I connected through USB. Comparing the D1, I brought in my iFi Zen DAC in USB mode. And I have to say, the D1 was completely outclassed by the iFi product. The iFi provided a much lower noise output and a sense of polish and style across both percussion and vocals that was naturalistic, balanced, and easy on the ear. The D1 in comparison had a higher noise output, produced a rather tense response in comparison, which meant that the vocals were not quite as laid back, while the accordion, as one example, didn't flow quite so easily. Nevertheless, there was much to like within the Suncos D1, partly because of the extra features it offered on the chassis when compared to the iFi, but also its general output via DSD remained effective. The D1 did a good job in separating out the mass of information from varied percussion, secondary percussion, acoustic guitar, and that accordion. While noise might have been higher than the iFi, the D1 still offered an informative and entertaining presentation. There was space for detail to roam that gave the ear access to subtle areas of the soundstage. Now let me say this, there seems to be an awful lot of indigenous Chinese sourced material coming into the budget sector especially. We're seeing a swathe of DACs from indigenous Chinese companies and some people are seeing these DACs almost like it's a second coming. They're pumping up the reputation of this hardware to enormous great levels. They're seeing the decent build quality, they're seeing the relatively low prices, they're hearing a good overall performance, and they're being placed on a marble pedestal and being seen as giant killers. And that's not really the case. You have to stand back a little bit. A lot of this Chinese sourced hi-fi is excellent, don't get me wrong. They offer great price points, wonderful value, lots of features, and they're well worth your attention. But don't get carried away. There are lots of other DACs out there that are better performing, offer better support, offer better manuals, offer a superior interface, and are just better all round. And the new products from iFi are just one set of examples, and there's others out there. The great thing about the recent influx of indigenous Chinese hardware, hi-fi hardware, is that they've infused the budget sector with life. They've really heated up the competition, and this sector really needed that. The budget sector, especially in the digital domain, really needed a kick up the pants, in my opinion. And these Chinese products are really giving this sector a focus and great attention. And they're really pushing up sound quality. They're really pushing up standards. So I welcome them, but I just encourage you don't get too carried away. Retain a little bit of perspective. And when you're looking to purchase a DAC or whatever it might be, just look at some of the other newly released competition as well. Don't just focus on the new Chinese brands, as great as they are. But getting back to the D1, that particular product offers plenty of features that work well at this price. There's better options if you want a USB DAC, I have to say. The balanced output was a disappointment, while the interface and support options were, I'm afraid, substandard. 
Even so, the D1 remains a good example of the genre, giving the ear a sense of maturity in the mid-range via single-ended mode with a naturalistic bass and relatively extended dynamic reach to provide a neutral output for a DAC of this type and price point, offering plenty of features, retaining a small form factor and price point. The LA QX D1 offers a great choice for anyone looking to build a digitally based budget hi-fi. So a fascinating product and I enjoyed reviewing it indeed. And I hope you will join me for the next one. Thank you very much for staying to the end of this video. Thank you very much for subscribing. Your support is very much appreciated indeed. And hopefully we will meet again in the next video. Until then, bye bye for now.